Welcome to the Ice Faces Introduction to JSF 2.0. JSF is the standard web app framework for the Java Enterprise Edition or Java EE. Why should we use JSF? Well, as a Java standard, it has great industry support. It's growing in usage worldwide. It has strong support in Java IDEs. And most importantly, Ice Faces is built upon JSF. JSR 127 defined and released the JSF 1.1 standard in 2004 and this JSR was co-chaired by Craig McClanahan and has a dependency on Java 1.4 and Servlet 2.4. JSR 252 then defined and released JSF 1.2 in 2006 with a dependency on Java 5 and Servlet 2.5. JSR 314 began its work in May 2007 <clears throat> and defined and released JSF 2.0 in July of 2009. It's import important to note that iSoft Technologies is a member of the JSR 314 expert group and has been actively involved in the development of this latest JSF release. Now in order to use JSF in our application we are going to need an implementation. So the JSF API is basically a set of interfaces and classes that define a contract which a reference implementation, or RI for short, must fulfill. Now we have two possible options for open source JSF RIs. The first is the Oracle RI codename O'Hara, and this includes the JSF API and impl jars. We could also use the Apache MyFaces reference implementation by including the MyFaces API and MyFaces impl jars in our application. But for this course, we are going to use the Mohara implementation. JSF has a large number of features, most notably that it implements the model view controller design pattern. And what this design pattern does is that it makes applications much more manageable because the view, our page, is cleanly separated from our model, our data, and our controller. JSF supports rapid application development through the use of UI components and these components are user interfaces developed with reusable components and there's many component suites available such as ice faces. JSF has render kits whereby components can render themselves according to multiple client devices and it's worth noting that ice faces is a render kit extension. JSF supports validation and conversion where user input and server output can be controlled by JSF. The framework is highly extensible with its pluggable architecture. So for example, we could swap in or swap out our navigation handler, the view handler, phase listener, the expression language resolver, or possibly validators and converters. JSF has great support for internationalization or I18N, where views can manifest themselves in different languages. Now in JSF 2.0, JSP has been dropped in favor of facelets and with facelets we have two very important features. Templating, which of course provides a powerful templating mechanism, and composite components where we can easily create custom pieces of markup with facelets. And we'll see examples of these later on in our course. Now when we think of IDEs in JSF, we think of tooling. So JSF was designed to simplify user interface construction for web apps. And originally, one of the key requirements was to support tooling, such as that of Microsoft's Visual Basic style drag and drop design of pages. So the following IDEs support some form of JSF tooling. Um, the first four also have an iSpaces plugin available but we can choose from any of these to begin our JSF development. In terms of servlet container compatibility, JSF 2 requires servlet 2.5 and can be run on Tomcat 6 or 7, Glassfish 3 and JBoss, JBoss 6 just to name a few. And here we have previous requirements for JSF 1.2 and JSF 1.1. JSF does support portlets and the JSR 127 and JSR 168 specs were both defined way back in 2003 and were designed to be interoperable. 
So to run a JSF web app as a portlet, a portlet bridge is required. And the most popular bridge is the Sun Open Portal JSF portlet bridge. Ice faces can be run in a portal environment by using the portlet faces bridge. And more information on that bridge is available from icefaces.org. Now the following portals or portlet containers support JSF portlets, the Liferay portal, JBoss, Apache JetSpeed, BEA WebLogic, and IBM WebSphere. In a nutshell, uh, J JSF is a user interface framework for Java web apps. So our user interface is constructed from reusable UI components. JSF simplifies data transfer to and from the UI, which we'll see in future exercises. User interface state can be managed between client requests. It provides a simple action model mapping client events to server-side application code and allows for custom UI components to be easily created and reused. So again, we're going to see examples of all of these functionalities later on in our course. Now, with UI components, each element is displayed on the client screen. It's going to be mapped to a UI component in our JSF view code. So on the left-hand side, we have a panel tab set, and within that tab set, we have three different types of input text. And on the right-hand side is our JSF view code. So we have our encapsulating H panel tab set component, and nested within that component, we have our input text for name, input secret for password, and input text area for our comment section. Now, the JSF framework manages the hierarchy of components in a component tree on the server. So although our components are specified declaratively using XML markup, their runtime representations are going to be Java class instances that are maintained by the framework in a component tree. And so this component tree has a short life cycle, roughly the duration of a request and response. So at the bottom of our screen here, we have an example of a component tree. We have our UI view root, which is our top, top node in our component tree. And within that, we have our JSF components and tags. We have an HTML form. And within that form, we have our HTML output label, an input text, a message, and command button. So the component tree essentially has a one-to-one -one relationship with components in our view. Except for the fact that on, in the component tree, they are live Java class instances. Now there are three parts to a JSF component. Class is the actual Java class representing the core logic of the component. The tag class allows the component to be used on our page. The renderer class contains code to render the UI component. Now we don't recommend creating your own JSF components as it can be non-trivial, but instead we recommend creating facelets composite components which are quite easy to create and use. And we're going to cover one of those uh, in our exercises later on. Now, JSF provides a simple value binding mechanism in order to bind our view to our model. And simple Java types such as string and int are automatically converted by the framework. So when we submit our form, all values in our form will be sent as strings in a request parameter map. Um, and Perhaps, though, those values may have different data types server-side in our managed means. So JSF is going to automatically convert types such as string and int, and there's no need to manually clean and convert these values because, again, JSF will do that for us. And finally, extension points allow for the conversion of more complex Java objects. So again, at the bottom, we can see the request. JSF is going to convert the string to integer from the request parameter map to our, of course, component set submitted value. The lifecycle will execute, and JSF will then convert our integer back to string and then send the response back to the client. Now, traditional web applications could store application state in the HTTP session and request maps, but JSF provides many new ways to maintain data between client requests. So, in JSF, this state management is known as scope. And there are many scopes available. So we have application scope, session, view, request, and flash. 
and we're going to talk more about these in depth in, a ne in one of our next slides. Now JSF is an action framework and simplifies application development through the use of actions so we can think in terms of component actions rather than form submits to execute logic. So for example we have an h command link on our page and it is has a method binding to a method called action method on the bean my bean. So this Java bean code for action method is going to be executed when the command link is clicked on. JSF allows for the creation of custom components, so vendors like ISOF provide rich custom components. Developers can create their own simple composite components using facelets, or alternatively, you could create your own JSF component. Now on this screen, we just have a, a number of the IceFaces rich components. So for example, on the left-hand side, the calendar, the select input date, and to the right, the ice data table, um, the pop-up panel, our menu bar, and various other Ice Faces components. Now there are a large number of new features in JSF 2.0. For example, um, the simplification of the composite component creation process, so that has been much improved in JSF 2.0. JSF 2 also provides native AJAX support. It's introduced partial state saving. In terms of navigation, we can now do implicit or conditional navigation. For scopes, there are three new scopes, view, flash, and custom. And finally, the addition of annotations reduces the size and complexity of our, of our faces config file. So there are a large number of new features that can be, can be leveraged in JSF too. And that concludes our introduction to JSF. We're now going to create our first JSF2 Eclipse project. The goal of this exercise is to create a JSF2 project with Eclipse 3.6, otherwise known as Helios, and source from the project template will be imported into our new JSF2 Eclipse project from our exercises folder. Step one is to create a new dynamic web project in Eclipse, and this can be done in one of two ways. So opening up Eclipse, we can right-click on the Project Explorer and select New Dynamic Web Project, or we can select the same option from the File menu. And this then brings up our, our new project creation wizard. Step two is to give our project a name and to configure it to be a JSF2 project. The project name is going to be lowercase j, uppercase a, job application. We're going to use the default project location and we're going to select it to be a JSF version 2 project. This application is going to allow job applicants the ability to submit a resume to our fictitious company in hopes of securing a job. So let's drop down the configuration to be JSF version 2 project. And then we'll select next. Step three is to simply skip over our Java paths portion of the wizard since nothing is required here. So we'll just hit next. Step four is then to rename our web content directory. Now, we're just going to change web content to web in order to maintain consistency across IDEs, but this is, of course, not required. So let's just quickly make that change from web content to web, and then we'll hit next. We're now going to select our JSF capabilities. Now, the first time that we create a JSF2 project, we're going to have to download the appropriate jars. So on the right-hand side of our wizard there, there's a little download icon. So we're going to have to download our JSF jars. So clicking on this icon brings up a list here of potential libraries. We have the My Faces implementation and the Mohara JSF implementation. Now, we're going to stick with Mohara, so I'm going to select that and click Next. 
I'm going to accept the terms of the license agreement and select finish. We're then going to download our 8 meg JSF jars. JSF jars are downloaded. We can then make sure that they are selected and we can leave these settings as is. And then we can select finish to create our first JSF2 Eclipse project. Now returning to our slideshow, again we selected the download icon to download our JSF jars. Step 5a was to download our JSF implementation library and we're going to choose the Mohara JSF 2.0 implementation. So we selected that version, click Next, accepted the license and clicked Finish for each. Now we can ensure that our project was properly created. So let's go back to Eclipse and verify that we have a JSF version 2 application. We're first going to go into the Java resources and look in the libraries. Here we can see that we have our JSF version 2 Mohara implementation which includes the JSF API and JSF impl jars. We also have our web content directory but we're going to import our files from our exercises there shortly. Step 7 is to begin that import process of our template source. source. So we're going to right click on job application and we're going to choose import and then the sub menu item import again. So we're going to right click on job application and then import and import. Now these files are going to come from our file system so we're going to obviously enough select file system and then select next. So file system is under the general tab and we're going to select that and then hit next. Step 7b is now to import our project template source. So we're going to navigate into our exercises folder, into our first exercise, and navigate to the web app portion of the uh, provided files. We're going to choose that, and we're going to have to make sure that we have selected, checked off the web app directory, and we're then going to have to make sure we're over, we overwrite existing resources without warning, and most importantly, we want to make sure that we're importing these files into the folder job application slash web. So let's go and do that now. So I'm going to try and find these files on my file system. And they're in our solutions folder. So making my way in job application source main and then web app. And then I'll select open. From there I'm going to check off web app. I'm going to make sure that we're importing into the folder web and that we overwrite existing resources without warning. Once complete we'll then see that we have a new file two new files, an index.jsp page and a start.xhtml page. We're now going to open up start.xhtml but we're going to open it with the web page editor and what this is going to give us is a design time canvas that will allow us to drag components and tags onto this canvas from our palette but also the option to work directly with the XHTML source below. So in Eclipse, we're going to right click on start.xhtml, we're going to open with web page editor,
And here we go. We have our design time canvas. Again, the visual representation of our XHTML markup below. Again, this is the, the source code behind that page. And if we click on this little arrow here next to the design canvas, we can bring up our palette. And this is where we're actually going to drag tags and components from onto our, our canvas in future exercises. So we have the JSF HTML components, the core tags, and so forth. Step nine is to now run our application on a server. So we're going to right click on job application. We're going to select run as and then run on server. So again, right click on our application and we'll select run as, run on server. We're going to select the Tomcat 7 server and we're going to specify that we always use this server when running this project. And then we'll select next. So going back to our IDE, I've selected Tomcat 7 and we're going to always use this server when running this project and I'll select next. Now if you don't have this, if this is your first time adding this server, you will have to, in a screen not shown here, browse to the Tomcat server directory. A very small step, but needs to be done uh, the first time you use Tomcat 7. After completing that step, we're then taken to the configuration screen where we can see that there is a list of available applications and also on the right hand side the deployed applications on Tomcat. So in this instance we have job application ready to be deployed and then we'll select finish to, to deploy that. So we can now see in our console that Tomcat has started and in our Eclipse browser we now have our application up and running. So again, here's our, our finished, finished application, very basic. But we now have our, our first JSF2 Eclipse project up and running. The JSF expression language. Page Markup will want to access Manage Bean properties. As we learned previously, JSF implements the model view controller design pattern. So in this case, we're going to use expression language to bind our view to the model. In order to access Bean properties, JSF uses Java introspection. So let's consider the Bean instance variable name. Most importantly, we have a getName and setName call. GetName will retrieve the value for name whereas set name will set that value for us. And these are required by JSF, again, to access Bean properties. Boolean instance variables are slightly different, with the difference being that instead of a get rendered call, we have is rendered. For introspection to work correctly, the class must have a zero argument constructor, but a constructor is not required. It's worth noting that the instance variable isn't actually needed either for an introspection to resolve. All we need is the getter and setter in our managed bean. We should make sure to avoid public instance variables since introspection won't call their getters and setters. Public instance variables can also make debugging more difficult. Finally, static instance variables also cannot be accessed through introspection. Bean properties can be exposed to expression language and let's consider the named bean applicant with a setter getter for the property first name. The JSF expression language for accessing this property will look like this. We'll have a pound symbol followed by an opening bracket, the bean instance name applicant followed by the property name, first name and a closing bracket. It's important to know that the framework will call the getter and setter methods for us as needed. So JSF takes care of all the underlying plumbing for us so we can focus on our productivity. 
The expression language, notation, pound, open and closing bracket, defers evaluation to runtime, and this is the syntax that we're going to want to use 99% of the time. Now, the EL notation, dollar sign, open and closing bracket, is a compile time or immediate evaluation, which can offer some page level optimizations inside of looping structures, but again, this notation is rarely used. What happens when an expression is, ev is evaluated? Well, there is a bean lookup and a reflective bean property resolution. JSF de defines various implicit objects and class types, for example, the faces context, which contains all of our per request state information related to the processing of a single JSF request, essentially a window into all things JSF. We also have header maps, parameter maps, and various other objects and class types. We can use operators in our expression language, for example, arithmetic, relational, logical, conditional, and empty. At the bottom of our screen, we have an EL expression containing some of these operators. So for example, in our component, we have a rendered attribute. So this, whether true or false, will either render or not render the component to our view. Now in this case, we have the myBean.value, and if that value is not empty and myBean.rendered returns true, well, this EL expression is going to evaluate to true and we will render our component. Expression language can also be used to directly access arrays, lists, and maps. So arrays and lists can be accessed via an index number, whereas map values can be accessed via a value key. JSF Manage Beans JSF allows users to design a complex tree of named plain old Java object beans. Beans have a predetermined lifespan known as scope and can be defined in one of two ways using the manage bean creation facility where we add a manage bean definition to our faces config file or through the use of Java EE5 annotations available in JSF2. Manage beans also have a life cycle which depends on their specified scope. Application developers have full control over application design with plain old Java object beans and full control gives us great flexibility in our design, but it can also expose us to common design errors. Bean names uniquely identify the bean within the context of the application. They follow the same naming conventions as Java classes, which is mixed case starting with lowercase. Bean names can be defined in the faces config file. So here, for example, we have the opening and closing manage bean tags. And nested within, we have the manage bean name tag, and the name in this case of our bean is lowercase m, uppercase bean and name, followed by the fully qualified class name. Now JSF2 introduces the at manage bean annotation, which will allow us to clean up our faces config files and put all configuration into the actual manage bean classes. So names can be specified with the name attribute. In this case, we have the at manage bean definition, and the name of the bean will be lowercase s sum name. If a name is not specified, the class name is used as the bean name, which again is mixed case starting with lowercase. The eager attribute can be used to ensure that a bean is loaded in a non-lazy fashion, but normally we will have eager set to false and allow JSF to create our beans in a lazy loaded fashion on demand. JSF 1.1 and 1.2 originally defined four scope types. Application, where the lifespan continues as long as the application is deployed. Session, which has a lifespan of the HTTP session and is destroyed by session timeout or manual invalidation. A session is unique to each user, but can be shared across multiple browser tabs. The request scope's lifespan is the duration of an HTTP request received by the server and a response sent back to the client. And if there's no scope, a bean isn't placed into scope. JSF2 introduces three new scopes. The view scope, where the bean lasts the duration of the view or the page, but page navigation or page refreshes will cause the bean to be destroyed and reinitialized. Flash is a short conversation style scope that exists for a single view transition, but will survive reloads. The custom scope allows developers to implement their own custom scope behavior. Once a bean is defined in the faces config XML file, 
or with an annotation, it has a default of request scope. Bean, bean scope can be defined explicitly in the faces config entry. So in this case, we now have the managed bean scope tag, and within it, we can choose from one of five scopes, application, session, view, request, or flash. Now, how do we know which scope to use? Well, we should try to avoid jamming all state into the session scope, which will result in memory accumulation. We should start with request scope beans since they're actively garbage collected. Again, they have the shortest lifespan, roughly the duration of a request and response. But if we need the bean to live longer, we should then move it into view scope and so on until we get our desired results. Bean scoping is a fine balance between memory usage and a rich user experience, and it can be difficult to achieve both. Scopes can also be defined with annotations, which again will help clean up our faces config file. We can define the at application scoped for, obviously, application scope, and so forth. JSF implementations running in a Java 5 compliant container have access to two other annotations the at post construct and at pre destroy annotation. Methods on managed beans can be annotated, so in this case we have the at post construct annotation on the my method method. Now when the bean is initialized, the, me the method binding for app post construct is called immediately after the class is initialized. And this is very handy for initializing data at construction time. Now at pre destroy is called just before the bean is removed from the container management. So bean scope plays an important role as to when this method is called. And it's very handy for proactively cleaning up memory footprint or unregistering a class from a listener. Our next exercise is on the JSF bean scopes. Now the prerequisites are that we've successfully completed our first project and that we have at least two different web browsers installed. So the goal of this exercise is to create a few simple beans and experiment with the characteristics of various bean scopes. So we're going to create four beans, each having a different scope. So we're going to have one that has application, one for session, one for view, and one for request. And what we're going to do is bind these beans to a test page and see how they behave in a web browser. And of course, to bind our view to the model, we're going to use expression language. So our first step is to create an application scope bean. So as we know, the application scope, scope's lifespan, will continue as long as the application is deployed. So let's go back to our IDE and let's create a new class. We're going to create applicant controller and we're going to create this in the org ice faces training applicant view controller. So I'm just going to copy this package name and let's go back to our IDE and create applicant controller. So let's expand our project and to create a new class what we're going to do is we're going to right click on our source folder and select new class. We'll paste in our, our project our, sorry, our package name, and we're going to call this class Applicant Controller. And then we'll select Finish. And now we have our, our first JSF class, which soon will become a managed bean. Step two is to set up Applicant Controller. So it's going to implement Serializable. We're going to add the managed bean annotation to the class to register this bean with the JSF managed bean creation facility and we're going to give it the name application controller. We're then going to add the scope to the class and again this is going to be an at application scope bean so we're using JSF2 annotations. We're then going to add our imports and then we're going to override the two string method in order to output the object stamp and this is going to be used to compare different bean instances um, once we run, run this code. So first things first, let's implement serializable on our bean. And we can hit control space to, to, to leverage Eclipse's autocomplete functionality. So I'm going to choose the Java IO serializable. Then I'm going to come back to our slide and I'm just going to copy our at manage bean definition. And so this goes directly above our, our class name. 
And then below that, we can type in at capital A application and hit control space to have Eclipse autocomplete again, finish that for us. And now in order to resolve missing imports, there's a couple ways we can do this. We can hover over Manage Bean and we can import our missing import here, Javax Faces Bean, or we can hit Control Shift O. If we hit Control Shift O, JSF will automatically uh, find the correct imports. And if it is unsure, it will prompt you. So now we have an application scoped JSF Manage Bean through the use of annotations. And our final step here is just to add our, our two string. So we're going to compare again bean instances. So we'll just grab that. And we're going to actually repeat these same steps for each of our four different bean scope types. So we'll get we'll get used to doing this. And then we can do a control shift F to format our code. Step three is to add an EL expression for our applicant controller. This is going to output our object stamp as per our two string. And we're just going to add this where the hello world paragraph was in start.xhtml. So I'm going to copy this list item. And we'll go to Eclipse. And we're going to open start.xhtml by double clicking. And you can see that we are still in the web page editor mode where we have our design time canvas. So I'm just going to make that a bit smaller so we can see. And I'm going to replace the hello world portion here. Now step four is to run our application. So what we're going to do is either start or restart our server. And we're going to open a second web browser to the same URL. So I'm going to open up Firefox and then Safari. And the application scope bean object stamp should be the same since this bean is in application scope and will be available for the duration of the applic application. So let's go and open Firefox. So in this case, our application is called Job Application, all one word. And the page we're going to be hitting is start.jsf. Now, in this case, I'm going to need to restart my server since I have made some changes and forgot to do that. So quickly, restart our server. So if you don't see changes applied directly to your view, just perhaps give a server restart to ensure all changes have been pushed to the deployed war file. And so now I can refresh the page and we have our object stamp for the application scoped applicant controller which is 67A5FB5A. Now we can verify that this bean is an application scope because all instances of applicant controller should have the same object stamp. So taking this same URL, going to paste it into Safari and we should see the same object stamp which is 67A5FB5A. So that's an example of an application scoped bean where the lifespan is as long as the application is deployed. Now let's now create a session scope bean where the lifespan is that of the HTTP session. So let's go and create a new package called view.model and we're going to create a class called view properties. Now to quickly, to quickly create a new package, what we're going to do here is again right click on source and select new class. But for package we're going to select browse and we're just going to choose a base name. So we'll select one with the applicant view and we'll just depend on model. And this class name is going to be called view properties and will be session scoped. Again, we're going to have to set up view properties. So we're going to implement serializable. We'll add our at manage bean definition. But this time we're going to make it session scoped. And then again, we'll add our two string to output the object stamp. 
So let's take this manage bean definition and also implement serializable on our class. And then we can hover over at manage bean and resolve the missing import. And then below at manage bean, we can specify session scope. And our final step is to add our overridden two string method. Now step seven is to display our bean in start.xhtml. So we're just going to add this list item for session so that we output our object stamp so we can do our comparisons with our different browsers. So let's go back to our IDE and this time into start.xhtml. So we'll just place this list item below the application list item. Now step eight is to run the application again. So we're going to restart our server and we're going to open up a second web browser to the same URL. Now the object stamp for our session scope beans should be different between browsers. Of course, for each browser instance, that's a separate session. Now, if we open up a new instance of the same browser, we're going to see the same session object stamp. Because multiple tabs within a browser are treated under the same session. So again, I'll make sure to restart my server here so that all of our changes are pushed to the deployed WAR file. Eclipse does have a hot deploy feature, which is great for page level changes, but a lot of source code changes may, may not be reflected, so it's a good idea to do that as much as possible. So now we can hit our page, and we have a session scope bean with an object stamp of 5 6 cdd 54 e We can then bring up Safari, refresh, and we can see that the session scoped object stamps differ. So these are two separate instances of this same session scoped bean. Now if we were to open up a tab within Firefox, we can see that both of those object stamps are the same, indicating that both tabs are using the same session scoped bean. So now let's move on to using a view scoped object. Lifespan can be considered longer than a request and shorter than a session. So as the name implies, beans placed into view scope are in existence until the user finishes interacting with that current view or page. So just as in our previous two um, exercises there, we're going to create a class called job applicant and it's going to be a view scoped bean under the package uh, view model. So let's go to our IDE. And this time, since that package is already in existence, we're going to right click on the package name and we're going to say new class. And what this does is it pre populates our package name for us. So now all we have to do is type in the class name for our view scope bean which is job applicant. Now as I'm sure you can imagine, guess what step is next? Well, we're going to set up job applicant. So just the same four steps here. We're going to implement serializable. We're going to add our manage bean definition so that JSF knows that this bean is should be instantiated and destroyed as per the lifespan. So let's go and do these same steps. Implements serializable control space just to speed things along. And then we can hover over manage bean and add our import. And then we can again use the Eclipse autocomplete. So we'll type in view control space and that will autocomplete for our view scoped annotation. And then finally, we can add our two string. 
method. So we'll just grab that and we'll place that within our class. Now step 11 is to add our output below our previous list item, which would have been the session scoped object. So let's add our view scoped manage bean, the EL expression, which will output our object stamp. So that, of course, is in start.xhtml. So we'll just add this new list item. Now we can restart our server and run the application. So we're going to open up a new window or tab in the same browser to our same URL. And the object stamp for our view scoped bean should be different between windows and tabs. So as we know, a view scoped object is essentially tied to that page or view. And, but if we refresh the window and tab, we'll see that we get new instances of the view scoped object. So a page refresh will reinitialize that object. So let's go and restart our server. So that's restarting. And we have two instance, uh, two tabs open already into our application. So we can see that our view scoped object has an object stamp of D89D7EB. And then our second tab has a different object stamp. So our managed beans, there's two separate instances for two separate views. Now finally, we're going to create a request scope bean whose lifespan is the duration of a request and response. So it's the shortest of these scopes. Now let's create a new class called request test under the model package. So we'll right click here, just expand this over. We'll right click on model and we'll select new class and we'll call it request test. And of course we have our package name pre-populated for us. We'll click finish and we'll move on to the next slide which surprise surprise is our same four steps so let's go through and do that now. Just going to copy that and we're going to implement serializable. We'll add our manage bean definition and we can hit control shift O to automatically resolve missing imports. We can then add our request scoped annotation And then we'll need to copy over our toString method. And we'll format that. Now let's add our request test instance to our page. So we'll go to start.xhtml and add our final list item. And we're also going to add a command button. And this is going to be placed directly above our final form tag. So we'll just copy this command button. And then we'll go to our IDE and we'll just scroll down to our closing form tag and we'll just paste our command button. And this is going to be used in our next slide to demonstrate um, request scoped versus view scoped. All right, so let's restart our application and we're going to look closely at the object stamps for the view and request beans. So we're going to refresh the browser and both object stamps should be refreshed, of course, Refreshing the page will cause the 
cause these beans to be reinstantiated. But what we're going to do is we're going to then click on the submit button and this is going to generate a page request, a request in response. And what we're going to see is that the view stamp will stay the same. The view scoped object will persist over user interactions. But the request scoped object, whose lifespan again is just a request in response, um, is going to change. So let's go back to our IDE and we'll just right click on our server and restart. And then we'll come back to our Firefox window. And so we can see that we have a request object stamp of 57F and 20E for the view scoped object. If we refresh, of course, both are reinitialized. But if I click on the submit button, which generates a page request, we can see that only the request scoped object stamp is changing. So a new instance of the request scope bean is being created for each page request. And that concludes our exercise on JSF bean scopes. Our next exercise will be to add value bindings to our application. Now prerequisites include that we have successfully completed our first project along with the exercise on our JSF bean scopes. Step one, we're going to create a blank job applicant page. So we're going to right click on the web folder and we're going to create a new file named job-applicant.xhtml. So we're going to build this page up over the course of the exercise. So let's go to our IDE and we're going to right click on web and we're going to select new file and if you don't see file here you'll want to select other and then come down here to general and select file. The name of this page is going to be jobapplicant.xhtml. So with facelets, the default suffix for pages is xhtml. And this stands for XML compliant HTML markup. So we'll select finish. And now we have our blank file to work with. And I'm going to close job applicant for now and reopen it in our web page editor. And so in the coming slides, we're going to use the JSF palette to drag and drop components onto our design time canvas. Step two is to paste our doc type and root tag. So we're going to paste in again the doc type, which specifies this document as an XHTML doc, along with our root tag, which is our HTML tag and includes various namespaces which allow us to use these components and tags on the page. For example, the facelets component and tags, the JSF HTML tags, and the JSF core tags as well. So we'll grab this piece of code and we'll just drop that into our blank file. And we'll do that in our source code editor here. We're then going to start using the palette to drag and drop components into our design time view. So our first component to drag is the h colon head tag and this is found in the JSF HTML palette. So on the right hand side of our screen we have our palette. Again it's the small arrow here and we can click to expand and contract. And we're going to go into the JSF HTML palette and we'll look for the head tag and we're just going to drag this onto our palette here and you can see that the design time view and the source view are in sync so when we drag that head tag we see the corresponding h head tags in our source view Step four is to add a body tag inside of our HTML element. So again, from the JSF HTML palette, we're going to drag that onto our design view. So we'll find body at the very top here. And we'll just try and 
drag that here. Now the design time canvas doesn't always work as expected. So in this case the body was dragged inside of the head tag, but in our source view we can easily correct this by just cutting it out and placing it after the head tag and a control shift F will help us format our, our source code. Step five is to add a form element inside of our body tag. So again, in that same JSF HTML palette, we'll drag the form inside of our body. So we'll look for form, and here it is, and we'll drag that inside of our body tag here. So it says place inside of the H colon body, which we want. And here we go, we have in our source view our body tag and nested within that we have our opening and closing form tag elements. Step six is to add an input component. So we're going to add an input text and in the palette it's going to be called text input and we're going to drag that inside of our form. So this will be our, our first input component added to our page. So going back to our IDE, we'll look for text input down at the very bottom of our JSF HTML palette and we'll just drag this into our body and form tag. Step 7 is to add an output label inside of our form and ahead of the input text. So again in our JSF HTML palette we'll just scroll up in our palette and look for the output label component and we'll just drag this ahead of our input text. But again, the design time drag and drop feature doesn't always work as expected, so in my source view here you can see output label was placed above the form, so we're going to have to just drop it in manually. So the design time view, I'm sure you can imagine, is great for rapid prototyping, but for developing, you may want to work directly with the source code since Eclipse has great features such as autocomplete, which will allow us to quickly add components to our, to our source code. Step 8 is to add an HTML4 line break. So this time we're going to go into the HTML palette and we're going to drag a line break after our input text. So here in our palette we'll close JSF HTML and we'll go into HTML4 HTML4 here and we'll scroll down until we see line break and I'll just drag that after our input text. Step 9 is to add an ID. So we're going to add an ID to the H input text component and we're also going to add a for attribute to the H output label and we're going to add the ID of the input text as the value of that for attribute and what this does is that it identifies the component for which this element is a label. And we're also going to change the value of the H output label to be first name. So let's copy this piece of code here. And we'll take that to our IDE. And this time we're just going to overwrite our existing code here, the output label and input text, with our updated code from the slide. So again, we have an input text with ID first name and a for attribute which corresponds to the ID of the input text. And what this does is that it generates a field set element which will help our layout. Step 10 is to add a manage beam property. Now that we've created this first name input text we have to create that value in our manage bean. So in jobapplicant.java, we're going to create the private string first name and we're going to click the source tab, the source menu item, and select generate getters and setters. We'll check the first name property and click OK. 
So let's go to jobapplicant.java and under our source package, the model package will open up jobapplicant.java and at the very top here we'll add a private string first name and now there's two ways to generate getters and setters as per the slide we can come up here to the menu item source and select generate getters and setters and this is often useful for perhaps many new fields that we've added where we can select all and generate all getters and setters or what you can do is simply hover over first name and select create getter and setter. And so we'll select OK. And now we have our, our set first name and get first name methods. So what the at manage bean definition will do is that it will cause the JSF manage bean facility to create an instance of job applicant whenever the EL expression job applicant is encountered in an EL value binding on our page. Step 11 is to create this value binding. So in jobapplicant.xhtml, we're going to add the following value attribute to the input text component. So adding an EL value binding is all it takes to bind our view to the model. So in this case, we're adding a value and we have our EL expression notation, the pound opening bracket, the name of our bean, job applicant, and the property first name. So we'll just copy that value, value binding, and we'll paste that into our IDE in the input text field. So going back to jobapplicant.xhtml, just expand that, and we'll just, in our input text here in our source view, we'll add our first EL value binding. Now similar to the first name, we're also going to add a last name property. And so this is going to be called private string last name. We'll generate the getters and setters. And then we're going to paste in an output label and input text similar to first name, but this time for last name. So I'm just going to copy this in advance to paste into our XHTML. And let's go back to job applicant.java and below first name. We'll add a private string last name. And then this time we can click the source tab and select generate getters and setters. We'll check off last name and select OK. And then job applicant.xhtml in our source view, so no longer the design time canvas, so I'll just shrink that portion and expand this. And then we'll add our code here and then we'll hit control shift F to format and now we have two form elements a first name and last name fields step 13 now is to add a command button so we're going to paste this markup inside of our closing H form tag so we'll copy our H command button and we'll take that to our XHTML page right below our closing form tag. And you can see now that we have a submit applicant button in our design time view. Step 14 is to add our value binding confirmation. So we're going to paste some markup after the closing H form tag. And these EL expressions will output the values in our view scoped instance of job applicant. So after entering form information and clicking Submit Applicant, we're going to see that while well, our Managed Beam properties will be set with our new values. So of course, in the, inst in the instance of clicking the Submit button, well, the JSF lifecycle will be called, which we'll get to later on, and we're going to set those values. And then below that form, our getters will be called, and we're going to return the value of job applicant first name and last name from our beans. So we'll copy this section here. Again, we're just outputting the values of the first name and last name fields. And these go below our last form tag. And now we can run our application. So we're going to visit job application slash job dash applicant dot JSF. And we should see our form here. So let's go back to Eclipse. 
And since we've made quite a few changes, you can either start your server or we can restart if you have it already running. And again, to ensure that all changes have been pushed across to our deployed WARF file on Tomcat 7. We're then going to type in our URL, localhost 8080 slash job application slash job dash applicant dot JSF. And now we have our, our first form here. So in the first name field, I can enter in the first name John, the last name Doe, and submit the application. And of course our manage bean setters will be called and we'll set the first name as John and the last name Doe. And then below in the server output the getters will be called and we're going to retrieve the values of first and last name which are John and Doe. And that concludes our exercise on JSF value bindings.